Hello, Kent Kentley here to finish reading you The Dark Secret of Weather End by John Belairs. We are on chapter 15, the final chapter of the story. Chapter 15. Who, a, who has dared to summon me in the midst of my most important work? Who has laid violent hands on the place from which I sprang? The greenlit face seemed to hover bodiless in the dark. Borkman looked from Miss Eels to Anthony and back again. In spite of the arrogant, mocking expression on his face, he seemed strangely uncertain. But as he continued to gaze at Miss Eels, his expression changed. The uncertainty vanished, and in its place came cold, venomous rage. You contemptible old hag, he snarled as he began to move toward her. Haven't I given you an idea of what happens to those who try to interfere with my father's plans? I was called into being to complete my father's greatest design, and I have been faithful. The final spell is at work. The apocalyptic storm is loosed upon the world. Nothing can stop it, nothing. But why in the midst of my incantations have I received a summons? Answer me! Miss Eels continued to stare glassy-eyed. She held the watch case up before her, and the chain pulled taut was still hooked on the fabric of the dead man's vest. Anders Borkman raised his hand, and Miss Eels began to speak. Her voice was dreamy and lifeless, almost like a recording. We came here because of the clues in your father's diary. We hoped we might find something that we could use to stop the storm you have started. Anders Borkman laughed loudly, unpleasantly. Ha ha! Ha ha! You really are a fool, he said, gazing steadily at Miss Eels. My father had no desire to stop his plan from being carried out. He would never have left anything that would stop the storm. You have come up here for nothing. Give me the thing you have taken, and I will show you what mis what a mistake you have made. Give it to me now! These last words were said in a harsh, commanding tone. Stiffly, Miss Eels held out her hand, and Borkman grabbed the watch case from her. He glanced down at the crumpled playing card, and an uncertain look, and the uncertain look returned to his face. He seemed bewildered, almost as if he had seen a playing card before. He had never seen a playing card before. Now he reached out and plucked with his fingertips at the edge of the pe at the edge of the piece of stiff crinkled cardboard. Slowly he eased it upward. Aha! Another surprise. There was something under the card, a small glass tube about two inches long. It was capped at both ends with silver, and there was raised lettering on the caps. Inside the glass was a dark reddish substance. Borkman let the playing card drop. It fluttered to the floor. With his index finger and thumb, he reached into the watch case and plucked up the tube. And then something totally unexpected happened. Long shafts of red light shot out of the glass. Lurid rays jabbed in all directions, splashing bloody color over the walls and floor of the chamber, and the st staring skull of the corpse in the coffin. Still clutching the tube, Borkman dropped the watch case and staggered backward. He bumped into one of the tall candlesticks, and it fell over with a loud echoing clatter. Then one sudden dazzlingly strong beam flung upward from the tube. It was like a long phosphorescent crimson spike, and it struck Anders Borkman full in the face. He screamed horribly, his red-lit face a mask of agony and terror. Then a blinding white flash like a phosphorus bomb went off in the room, followed by a dull boom. Miss Eels and Anthony fell to the floor. They were no longer paralyzed now. They were awake and aware and terrified out of their minds. They closed their eyes and covered their ears with their hands as flashes and explosions rocked the room. Finally, there was silence. Opening his eyes, Anthony peered out into the dark chamber. He could hardly see anything. Odd disks of pale red danced before him in the dazzling dark air. The flashlight lay nearby, and he groped until he found it, and then turned it on, stumbling to his feet. Anthony played the beam around J.K. Borkman. Anthony played the beam around. J.K. Borkman lay, still lay in his coffin. Miss Eels was kneeling and crying with her hands over her face, but she did not seem to be hurt. Anthony looked toward the candlestick that had fallen. Near it lay a crumpled black cloak, and across the floor, in a twisting, snaky pattern, wound a trail of grayish white dust. Miss Eels took her hands away from her face and peered blearily about. What? What on earth? She muttered thickly. The steady beam of Anthony's flashlight still rested on the trail of dust, and suddenly Miss Eels understood. Dust thou art, she said in a solemn voice, and unto dust thou shalt return. 
Anthony was still so shaken up that he was having trouble understanding what had happened. He... he's dead, isn't he? He said in a dull voice. The... the, the widget in the watch case... it... it... It finished him, said Miss Eels grimly. He didn't think that anything in the world could stop him, but he was wrong. What in heaven's name do you suppose that tube was? I don't know, said Anthony, looking around. Maybe it's on the floor somewhere. Let's look and see. They searched everywhere, under the folds of Anders Borkman's cloak, under the coffin, and in all the corners of the ugly stone room, but the tube had vanished. Miss Eels stood totally still, listening. Her eyes shone, and, in a triumphant, and a triumphant grin spread over her face. Anthony, she exclaimed, listen, the wind has stopped. There's no thunder. The storm is over. Anthony and Miss Eels stared at each other in wonder for a few seconds. Then, silently, they began collecting their things, and slowly they climbed the ladder. On the doorstep of the mausoleum, they paused to gaze at the scene before them. The ice-covered snow in the graveyard had turned to slush, and a warm spring-like breeze was blowing. The sky was clearing fast. Stars were showing through torn holes in the clouds. And as Anthony and Miss Eels stood watching, the moon suddenly appeared, throwing a long silvery beam upon the statue of St. Boniface that stood on the arch at the entrance to the, to the cemetery. His upraised hands seemed to bless the world and say that, after all the horrors, things were well again. Wow, said Anthony softly. We did it, didn't we? Miss Eels smiled wryly. Well, something did it, that's for sure. Let's get out of this place, she paused and grinned. Hmm, I wonder if those nuns over at St. Scholastica's would put us up for the night. And we'll pause there.